speaker is Tetsuya Yomo from Osaka University, and he will be uh, sharing with us some research on the adaptive response of a genetic switch. Oh, yes. do you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, first, first of all, I thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. And uh, today, okay, let's see. Let me start with uh, some kind of comparison between the machine and the organisms. Though everybody knows the computer is much precise as compared to the organisms, but it consumed a lot of energy. Here is the, this amount. And in general, to suppress this thermal noise, they use the large energy barrier. So to switch from one state to another, they need a lot of energy and they release a lot of heat. But on the other hand, organisms just have evolved to work with little energy consumption because the food is, has not been always available in the world here. So the barrier, energy barrier between the possible states may not be high enough. So they cannot, they may, you know, not always press this thermal fluctuation. So actually the recent study on the noise in gene expression revealed that uh, concentration of the expressed protein in the cell varied in a multiplicative manner from 50% to 200%. So in this sense, when you look at the single cell, the uh, our cellular network is kind of, you know, a network of largely fluctua fluctuating regulatory modules. So in a sense, uh, you should be very, uh, so let's see, um, to save your energy or to be friendly to the global uh, warming environment, you should be very patient to the some fluctuation or errors uh, in my broken English, in a sense. So, and then, of course, there is some kind of similarity between two. So, of course, both systems are controlled by you know, many kind of regulatory circuits like this. And then taking into account this similarity with engineering mind, we have synthesized the gene circuit to improve the cellular behavior for, let's see, in industrial application or so forth. But as I mentioned, the, if we look at the environment of the single cell, the environment is this kind, I mean, quite noisy. So, you know, the design circuit may not always work as we design, but, you know, and then, but the, from such kind of deviation, we can learn something new. So, in the synthetic biology on this line, in, in that sense, it's quite challenging and informative. But I would, be, let's see, emphasize here is that the cell or whole system may control these kind of the fluctuation. What I mean is that there, are kind of, there is a kind of some degree of the freedom or space as shown by this kind of fluctuation for, it, uh, for the cell to control you know, to create some behavior or new behavior beyond what, you know, the gene circuit or what we design. So in this talk, I will just emphasize that how the cell go beyond what we design, not how the gene circuit work well, you know, as I design, you know, or we design. So the target is the kind of the adaptive response to the environmental changes. So for frequently occurring environmental changes, of course, the cell usually employs the signal transaction machineries, which sense the environmental change and convey the transfer the information to the, the switch and then turn off or turn off the uh, gene expression, you know. And then this kind of the if-then-else type of the molecular gadget 
needs the many encounter to the same or similar environmental change in the past for their evolution. Of course, as you know, and uh, but for rarely occurring but various kinds of the environmental change, these kinds of signal transduction machinery may not always available because, you know, um, encoding all this kind of the signal transduction machineries may bring the too much burden to the cells or those molecular gases are not always useful in the most of the time. Therefore, they might be degenerated in, the, in time. So, but of course, the, the ancestors of the present cell uh, must have survived in the frequent uh, kind of the unprecedented environmental changes. So the question that I would like to raise here is that how did the cell adapt to the unprecedented environmental change for which no signal transduction machinery is available? This is a question that I would like to address in this talk. So to, for this, we just uh, make kind of the switch with bistability and then found that the cells top-down control of the switch through the kind of the fluctuation of noise. That's what I would like to show you today. So here is the kind of the toggle switch, you know, with mutually inhibitory operons. This one prohibited this, and this one prohibit, uh, inhibited this. So this kind of toggle switch has been studied many authors, but uh, what makes the different from ours from theirs is that there is a two marker enzyme which will work adaptively in environment or depletion of the glutamine or tetrahydrofolate, as I will explain later. So here is the expected or designed nature. Here the, in the rich meteor, you know, um, in the fluctuation of initial noise in gene expression, let's see, uh, this promoter ex express the little bit of this repressor, which reduce the concentration of the this, which uh, facilitate expression of the original operon more, right? So leading to the this stable state. But of course, they depend upon the initial fluctuation. So some of the cell may go down this way in the same way. So actually, we found the. Uh, two subpopulation in the same test tube among the isogenic or the cell carrying this toggle switch. This is just kind of designed nature. You know, this is kind of you know, what we design and just a stochastic differentiation. So the question that I would like to ask here is that when the glutamine is depleted, do the cell choose the right expression pattern, or I would say the attractor, where the glutamine synthetase is produced, expressed to compensate glutamine depletion? That's the question. So, and the answer is yes. That all the cell turn into the green, ignoring original stochasticity. I mean, which lead to the 50-50 population. And then the, the, this is a kind of same question. When the tetrahydrofolate is depleted, do the cell choose the light attractor? In this case, this one. Yes, of course, they all turn into the red, indicating that uh, um, this one where the DHFR is expressed to produce tetrahydrofolate. So point here is that the, there is no signal transduction machinery to sense that this deep nutrient depletion to tell the this promoter region. So this is a, just, you know, we are surprised at how they, they are smart. And then um, here's the, two scenarios that can explain this adaptive response. One is just simply uh, few lucky, some few lucky cells that happen to possess the feature phenotype just are propagated and they become a majority, which that, that what we did, you know, just measure. And the second scenario is that the 
each of the cells actually change their gene expression pattern to the adaptive side. So, and we did the kind of population analysis and uh, reveal that uh, scenario two is the uh, truth. So, uh, oops. after transfer the environment of the glutamine depletion, we take the sample at this time interval, and uh, here is the uh, x-axis represent the GFP over RFP, and Y represent the cellular density. So, till two hours, the area of the triangle is almost same, indicating that there is no cellular growth. But the uh, expression pattern shifted toward green. I mean, in this case, the adaptive gene expression pattern or attractor. So, this shift or adaptive change in gene expression is gross independent, gross free. And here is the, and the, but after they reach the adaptive gene expression pattern or attractor, they start growing like this. So here is a kind of subtraction between the two, you know, uh, cellular distribution. In the short period from 0 0.5 to two hours, the some cells with neutral gene expression pattern decrease in number, and the equal number of the cells with the expression closer to the adaptive attractor increase like this. And as the, there, is, there was no cell rupture in this short period of time, this result indicated that the, the cell here just change their gene expression and move it to here. So all this indicating that, you know, uh, cell, each of the cells actually change their gene expression toward the adaptive attractor before it's growing. And the one more careful uh, experiment that some of you might think that uh, unknown signal transduction machinery that could be encoded on the E. coli genome may be involved in this adaptive response. So to exclude this possibility, we did so-called swap experiment. So originally here, the, this kind of, uh, this uh, toggle switch show the green in glutamine depletion and the red. Uh, in the tetrahydrofluoride depletion to compensate the, these kinds of depletion. And then here, we just swap the position of the two marker enzyme in keeping the regulatory circuit as it were, as well as the color. So if unknown signal transduction machinery were involved in this adaptive response in the same environment should have shown the same color, right? But uh, what we observed is the opposite. You know, in the both uh, environments, they showed opposite color. So cell, so this adaptive uh, seems to choose, cell seems to choose the right attractor or promoter which encode adaptive enzyme. And what is the me possible mechanism? So M1 and M2 is a kind of concentration of the messenger RNA or pr protein products. And this is a term for the synthesis, protein synthesis. And this one is a term for the dilution due to the cell volume growth. And here is the term for the noise. And this kind of the, uh, deterministic control term just constitute double well potential with respect to the relative expression of the operon one over operon two. And here I would introduce, introduce the cellular activity, which unfortunately is kind of hard to define on the material basis, maybe related to the ATP or other many chemicals, but can be represented by specific cellular growth rate. So if 
the activity decrease, then protein synthesis term or dilution uh, due to the growth term may decrease. So the absolute of the, this deterministic control decrease with in, decrease of the with decrease of the activity. So it means that the surface is getting flatter, flatter relatively uh, relative to the intensity of the noise. So if we impose if we when we impose the asymmetrical uh, environment like this, you know, some of the cells just go down to the this attractor and some of them go down this, just stochastic differentiation as we design. But when we impose asymmetrical environment, then some of the cells uh, just straight go down to the adaptive attractor where they, they can keep the high activity as shown by this red line. But unfortunately, some of the cell just go down this way, they, because they just lose the activity and they start fluctuating like this because they flatter surface. And then, but by chance, they just, you know, back to the neutral position and they go down here. And this mechanism also related to sustainability. When they meet kind of unfavorite or unprecedented environments, then first they, of course, lose the energy, then start fluctuating, and then finally just find out, you know, a place where they can keep the high energy so they can back to the control, then start uh, stay there. So I, I would say that this kind of fitness induced attractor selection provides the cells some kind of sustainability in the unprecedented, unprecedented environmental changes. So much so on the kind of experiment on the artificial designed gene circuit, I will show the a little bit funny experiment. Just we just uh, mix the E. coli with picture stream, uh, just simple amoeba on the same plate, and then E. coli first uh, start growing faster than the amoeba at the beginning. And then uh, here the amoeba eat, start eating the E. coli, and here is the kind of amoeba got have to had to decide whether or not they should eat up the last their food, and then but and then till here the around one week, and then we gotta wait another one month here, and then found we found that the kind of mucoidal colony which is morphology is quite different from the normal E. coli colonies and where the two organisms coexist stably. So once it, this one formed, you know, we can, they just propagate quickly, you know, we can transfer to the next spread and then quickly grow. So, and the point here is that two organisms have evolved independently. Uh, what I mean is that the E. coli in the large intestine in the mammal and the amoeba in the horus. So I, I would say that it would be not very far from the reality that each of the organisms doesn't have any special problem to deal with each other, right? So how do they develop the symbiotic relationship? So here the, this histogram shows the eco, uh, kind of the fluctuation in gene expression as I explained before. So at the beginning, they just show the same kind of fluctuation as in the pure culture without any amoeba. But uh, when they reach the eighth day where the, the micro mucoidal colony appeared, then this kind of a cell with minor, minor gene expression pattern increase in time and they become a majority at the end. So I don't know the, I'm not clear what has happened in the cell, but the clear is that the fluctuation allowed the cell to choose the light gene expression pattern or attractor at the end. 
So, for the moment, time, right? Um, so, let me just a bit generalize what we found. What are we propose that the, here the dynamics of the G network like this can be expressed control term and the noise term. So X just represent a vector for the concentration of the many genes. And if the networks or some regulatory modules control each other in nonlinear manner, or this control term is quite nonlinear, then there will be uh, many, many uh, stable gene expression pattern or phenotype, which each of which corresponds to the body on this diagram. And uh, this control term and the noise both may depend upon the activity. But uh, as long as the control term decrease faster rate with decrease in, in the cellular activity than the noise does, then fluctuation, which is kind of the, the noise intensity over the control term, may increase at smaller activity. So the surface become flatter, like this. So when they, the cell meet unfavorable condition, then they just, they just first lose their activity and then start randomly searching the, their, you know, kind of the gene expression pattern, which, um, adapt to a fit to the, this environment, and then, find, and then recover the cellular energy, therefore recover the control, They're, that's why they can keep there. So, of course, there is a, some kind of drawbacks. If, you know, um, this kind of a control term is too tight, then fluctuation may be too small to swing over the body or takes too long time to search nice gene expression pattern. So, but the advantage here is that when they meet the unprecedented environmental change, then they can, you know, for which no signal transaction machinery is available, but they can control this kind of fluctuation to find kind of the adaptive gene expression pattern somehow. So I would emphasize that this kind of lateral selection will give the uh, cell the kind of advantage of fitness in the fluctuating environment. Finally, I would thank the, these collaborators and uh, Dr. Ng uh, who present the high efficient recombination uh, method to introduce the gene circuits into the E. coli genome. And also thanks should go to the this finance uh, uh, budget agency. And at the end, uh, finally, I would thank everybody for your kind attention. Thank you. We have time for questions. Question about your um, uh, your figure of, um, about the activity is related with the control noise and the fluctuation. How do you prove the fluctuation is reduced with the activity uh, uh, increase? In what? Increase, increasing. Um, Have you uh, proved prove it in uh, experiment? Uh, the relation. Yeah, that's good question. So the question is that the actually how the the activity correlated the noise or control term or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, actually, it's quite difficult. But what we observed is that the when we put the cells into the unfavorable condition, first that the uh, distribution getting wider first. 
So it means that the, they just do relatively they in the noise term dominated over the control term, right? Because they just lose and then start move to the attract, uh, adaptive attractor and they getting narrowed down. So this is what we observed. And then, but we haven't finished the exactly quantitatively, you know, the correlation between the noise term, control term, the activity. That's still, I haven't, I can't answer the quantitative model. That's, that's, that's what you want to say. Did you try the experiment where you make it favorable for green conditions and then change the conditions yet again to go back to red and, and watch them to change back and they do? Yeah, we did. And then actually, that the, I've, if I correctly remembered, uh, green to the red, it occurred nicely. Okay. But the other way, unfortunately, it didn't work. Because it's quite depend upon the time and the strength of the st stress, right? And then we just wait um, eight hours. Within that time, they cannot, you know, of course, some of them just move to the right attractor. But, you know, some, most of them, honestly speaking, 80% remain their wrong part and they fluctuate it. But at that time, the distribution is getting wider and wider, but they can't find a nice place. One more question. All right, let's thank our speaker again.